I'm Luke Desitels. I'm from North Carolina State University. My paper is also another type of sensory malware. <clears throat> Here's the high-level overview of our project. So I know I probably only have your attention for about 60 more seconds. I'll make sure you understand most of it before I get into the boring parts. We were able to take two mobile devices and allow them to communicate wirelessly without using radio signals. We used high-frequency sound signals instead. Um, we had to make sure these frequencies were above the range of hearing for most humans, but still within the working range for mobile devices. So the speakers would send out high frequencies, a microphone can pick them up, and then the owner does not notice. <clears throat> My paper discusses two types of inaudible sound. By inaudible, I just mean that humans can't hear them. The first one is what we're calling isolated sound. So your phone can vibrate. Most of the time, people hear this happening. However, if you limit the vibration to an extremely short amount of time, maybe one millisecond, you could feel it if you were holding it, but you wouldn't actually hear it if it was on a surface or something. Um, the paper goes into more detail as far as why this is important, but in this paper, uh, in this presentation, I'll stick to just ultrasonic sound. <clears throat> ultrasonic sound uses the speakers to produce very high frequency sounds, um, and then the microphone on the same device or another recording device can pick these up and decode them to get the digital data out. This works on the same principle as a dog whistle. If I blow on a dog whistle, a dog in the area could detect it, but a human would not. <clears throat> One of the first questions my advisor asked me was, why does this matter? All of these attacks can be done with Bluetooth. Well, over time, radio, including 4G, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth, have got a lot of attention in terms of security, and protections for them have evolved. For example, with Android, you need a permission to use the network or Bluetooth networks. Um, there are a lot of information flow control security extensions. Uh, Taintroid is a really good example for Android, and they monitor network ports. So if the device is trying to send out my credit card number over the internet, these different extensions can detect that and stop it. <clears throat> and lastly, a very paranoid user can just disable all of his radio networking capabilities, and that way there's no way data could get off. Um, however, in terms of sound, most of these things go away. There's no permission to regulate use of the speakers. And this is for Android. For iPhone, I don't think you have to request anything for the speakers either. It's usually ignored by users in these security extensions. Um, again, Taintroid does not check the speakers as an information sink. If you're sending it out over that, it wouldn't notice. And lastly, it's a little tricky to use sound and have it be subtle and stealthy. If the phone starts yelling out, this guy's credit card number is 431, and suddenly the user would be upset and they'd look into solving the problem. But if you use ultrasonic frequencies, they won't pick up on it. We made a few assumptions when we say that our, our transmissions are not detectable. One of the problems we encountered is children and animals can hear these ultrasonic signals. Usually they're not the victims we're interested in, but if you want to have a more comprehensive attack, you'd need ways to produce frequencies even higher than um, 18 kilohertz or, or even higher than 20 kilohertz would work well. Secondly, we assume that only the frequencies you want are being produced. Some speakers have a lot of trouble producing high frequency sounds, and they can either produce barely any noise at all, or they can produce a slight hum of frequencies you don't want that would be audible to the victim. Um, this is especially a problem when your bit rate and your amplitude become very high. I'll discuss this further in another slide. So to prove to my advisor that this was a thing and it was possible, I went into his office with two different mobile devices. It was a very crude experiment, but it was able to prove the point. On one, I had an iPad mini. I was running a dog whistle application. If you want to do this at home, the applications here are free. You can set them up. Um, it doesn't matter if you use two Android, two iPhone, you can find a way. But I played the dog whistle at about 18 kilohertz, and using a frequency analyzer on my Android phone, I showed him the spike of activity that you can see on the right side. So obviously, the devices could communicate. Um, we just needed to find a way to represent digital data in the analog waves. Um, I also note that we couldn't hear these things playing in his office, even though it was very quiet. <clears throat> Here are a few things we knew before we did any experiments. The hearing range for most adults stops at around 17 kilohertz. However, children can still hear above this. And then even beyond 20 kilohertz, I don't think any humans could hear these frequencies. Uh, this chart was from a news article. There was a group of enterprising teenagers 
who made a ringtone that was too high frequency for the professors to hear. They could send messages to each other in class, they'd all hear it and they'd know when to check, but they'd never get caught because the, the teachers are too old. <coughs> <laughs> On the right side, we have a diagram for frequency shift keying. There are a lot of ways to convert digital into analog and back again, but this is a very intuitive and simple one that we thought would work for our experiments. In the top row, you can see um, this represents binary or digital data. We have 10101. The second row is a carrier wave. In our case, we'd want to make sure this is a very high frequency above adult human hearing range. And the last row is a combination of the two. So we modulate our carrier wave with our digital data, and now you can represent... Uh, that's not me. I'm not doing it. Okay, no problem. <laughs> so... Uh, our, this bottom row represents a modulated wave in which a 1 is represented by a frequency higher than the carrier and a 0 is represented by a frequency lower than the carrier. It's, it's very intuitive when you see it this way. It's, it's a pain to implement, but if you're interested in exactly how we did it, you can look at further into the paper. These are the research questions we're interested in answering with our experiments. We wanted to know how fast you could transmit data and this would determine what kind of files are, are a threat. Can you leak a picture this way, or are you only limited to simple numbers? Um, we wanted to know how far away a recording device needed to be. Would it have to be in a very tight doorway where I walk past it, or could someone be recording from across the room? <clears throat> we need to know if devices can leak data through a pocket. Most of the time, your smartphone is going to be in your pocket, even if it's leaking ultrasonic sound. If it doesn't get out, it's not a very practical use. And lastly, depending on our results, we need to know if this is something worth trying to solve and if it's a practical problem. For our experiments, we chose several constants and variables. The low frequency we chose was 18 kilohertz. The high frequency is 19. We didn't have any problems with these being close together. We wish we could have had an even higher frequency so then children and some animals wouldn't be a problem. However, these are the frequency use, frequencies used by several other related papers. Um, and when we tried to use 20 kilohertz, our Nexus 7 devices, which are the ones we chose, uh, couldn't produce the amplitude we needed, so the signals weren't going through very clearly. Android is covered by a huge range of devices. Some might be better at this and some are worse. Um, we seemed to get results that indicated an iPad was more promising than a Nexus 7. We just didn't have as many Apple devices. The variables we tested were bit rate distance, and one of our experiments put the, the our Nexus 7 tablet into uh, the leg of some denim jeans and we folded it over. It was too big to fit in a pocket, but we still got it in there. One of the problems we ran into with frequency shift keying, and it's probably a more elegant way to solve it, but whenever you shift from one symbol to another, and in this case we're shifting from high to low frequency, you might not be at a very convenient part of your wave to do this. And when you have a, you have a dramatic break like that red arrow on the left, it can manifest itself as a click in the speakers. And when this starts happening too often, it's going to ruin the, the stealthiness of your attack. So what we implemented on the right is that we would reduce the amplitude at the beginning and the end of each symbol. This way, if you do have a dramatic shift in the pattern, it's so quiet you won't hear it anyway. So sometimes this became an issue. Um, you run into a limit with your bit rates. You can either produce so much noise that you're not stealthy anymore, or it becomes too hard to distinguish between the high and the low symbols. I have an example here. These don't represent actual results. This is just an intuitive illustration. At the top row, we're sending two signals. Um, the first is high, the second is low. In the second row, in the same amount of time, we're trying to squeeze in four symbols. So high, low, high, low. And you can still tell the difference visually. But whenever you get down to the bottom row and we're shoving in 16 symbols it just looks like garbage, and it sounds like garbage, and the decoder doesn't know what to do with it. <clears throat> the bitrate limit we ran into was about 345 bits per second. This was with two devices pushed right against each other. The distance was not an issue. However, if we increase at a bitrate faster than this, we start getting too much noise that we didn't want, and it was no longer worth saying that this would go undetected. The errors weren't a problem, but the noise ruined it, and so that's why we chose to stop at 345. My advisor forced me to put this slide in. I think it's too hard to explain, 
but he said it looked nice and technical. <laughs> <laughs> to evaluate our error rates, we had to use a multiple decoding scheme, and we had a system with parity numbers. Um, for our transmission, in this example, we want to send the word strawberry, and we've got 10 different letters. So what I did was intersperse the numbers 0 through 9 between each of the letters. And then whenever we receive and we try to decode, we need to know which decoding attempt is most likely to be correct. Um, without the numbers, we'd have no way of comparing them and knowing which one to choose, and you have a lot of different results. Some were horrible and some were very good. So we choose the result that has the most correct numbers. In this case, this would be the one with the red arrow by it. The green one is not as bad, and the blue one is terrible. No, almost none of the numbers are correct. Um, once we have our parity numbers checked and we know which decoding attempt we're working with, we go back and we take the letters we got, break them into ASCII bits, and figure out how many bits went wrong out of how many bits we sent over. So using these evaluation uh, methods, we tested several different distances, and you can see a nice quadratic curve, which is exactly what we expect when you're working with sound. Um, at around 100 feet, we had error rates around 20%. We started to have a lot of trouble getting everything to work correctly uh, continuously at this distance, and so we decided it was a good point to stop at. You can see the trend going. Um, obviously, if we had higher distance error rates, it would become impossible to get around. Um, we also tested a device inside of denim jeans. Um, at 20 feet, there was no significant increase in error rate because the device was inside of fabric. So we determined it's a very practical thing. You can leak data through your pocket. There are two major ways to abuse this. <clears throat> to give this example, I have to make up a password manager application. Um, imagine you've got an app where you can type in the name of your service and the name of the password that goes with it. So you have your Facebook password, and then you have your Gmail and your password. And this is probably a practical thing to have as long as it can't talk to other apps and it can't access the internet. There's no way it could let the information out. However, it can use the speakers on the device to send out ultrasonic sound and then the microphone on the same device to pick it back up again. And this allows two different apps on the same device to covertly communicate. You can do the same thing from one device to another. If I know that your phone's infected or if I'm looking for phones that are, I can have a recording device trying to pick up ultrasonic signals from a distance, uh, apparently up to 100 feet away. You can take the second type of attack, the inter-device attack, and use it as a, at a large scale to perform location tracking. If all your infected devices are leaking unique identifiers, say I'm number 512, and I walk past the recording device that's linked into a network, they would know that number 512 is at that location at that time when my device leaks its unique identifier and checks in. This allows you to track people's location without using any sort of radio network. So if they go into airplane mode, you still know where they are. There are a few solutions you can implement. <laughs> Uh, based on some of the questions and answers we had in the previous talk, we know some of these might be really hard to sell to phone companies. But you could embed a light um, that would indicate when the speakers are being used. You just have to convince them that it's worth doing. Um, you can also have hardware limits on your speakers that would prevent them from producing any ultrasonic sounds. Or you could, a very simple solution to privacy conscious people is a physical filter on a phone case so that the sound has to go through this physical barrier and it should block the ultrasonic frequencies, but not the lower frequencies. You can also have an application that detects suspicious ultrasonic use. And lastly, my advisor suggested this one. If you have a dog and you train it to eat your phone when it makes these noises, it'll work too. <laughs> For future work, we can try higher frequencies uh, on other devices. Like I said, um, Apple devices might be better at this. Uh, some Android device out there might be able to get a frequency too high for children to hear. We can use alternatives to frequency shift keying. This might allow us to have much higher bit rates, much higher distances. You can have more sophisticated recording devices. There's something called a laser microphone that looks for vibrations um, on the surface you're pointing your laser at, and it can hear things from extremely far away. Um, lastly, we can implement the solutions we've suggested. Um, I'll now take questions, and all of my source code is available on Bitbucket. Anything for Luke? Pretty good talk, by the way.
Um, so when you did these actual tests, did any of the audio information show up in Android's Logcat? And it'd say like a tone is being emitted and give any parameters about it? I wasn't using Logcat, okay. um, but that was one of the solutions I suggested. Some other application that would look for these activities um, and then later evaluate whether they're suspicious or not. Cool, thanks. Uh, you follow your own from University of Adelaide. Um, it's more of a comment uh, than a question. Um, the, uh, as far as we have, we've played with similar things and um, the uh, sampling rate seems to be the lim what limits the uh, frequency that you can use. Uh, so we haven't found a way to sample at more than 44 kilohertz and Nyquist theorem limits 22 kilohertz. So we are, you are pretty close at 18, 18 kilohertz. I agree, this is also something that I ran into. I think this is a limit I don't know if it's a limit on the microphone or the speakers, but I know that I couldn't get above 44,000 for the sampling rate as well. Um, I believe it's just the limitation of the hardware and the way they built them. So congratulations to your advisor. I think he's a very good advice <laughs> most of the time. Yeah, I'm, he got me this far. I, I'm quite surprised he didn't actually suggest that you play Jimi Hendrix for uh, while you, t you, you, you type your uh, you know, credit card numbers or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so background noise can be an issue. However, if you keep the, high s the ultrasonic frequencies uh, separate enough from the lower frequencies, they, they may be able to pull them out even if there is other noise. Um, it's kind of silly, but one of the experiments I had done, I didn't have a partner yet, so I'd set up one device and get it started playing the sound, and I'd run over to the other one, and then get that one to stop recording or start recording when I needed to, and my footsteps and running didn't seem to, to interfere with the project. Hi, Cynthia Irvin, Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, one, um, I could hear those sounds until I was about 30, mm. uh, so some adults can. Um, so number two is, you could actually compute theoretical limits for all of this, um, just using good old acoustics and physics, and then um, you could also apply digital signal processing and, and error correcting codes, not just uh, you know, a parity bit, uh, to improve your transmission. It's true. We had a limited amount of time and experience, but these are all things that had been suggested by my advisor. Um, and, and anyone else that wants to continue it even farther can implement these solutions. And I have met one other adult that could hear the frequencies, but aside from you and her, I haven't met anyone else that can. Thank you very much. Thank you.